I'm George Mann. I'm a writer, novelist, um, and screenwriter, um, as well as comics. Um, and I've been writing for about 20 years now. So I tend to write in genre, so dark fantasy, horror, and science fiction. Um, and I've, I've got a working tie in in terms of kind of Star Wars and Doctor Who um, and Warhammer, but I also write original fiction as well. Um, so created kind of a steampunk series called Newbreen Hobbs. Um, done some spooky crime novels um, and more recently some kind of high, kind of high fantasy writing as well. Uh, a big source of inspiration for me is kind of folklore, um, old mythology. I kind of like to, um, to look through kind of all the weird and wonderful British folklore and particular areas. You know, they all have their kind of spooky woods or stories about men riding pigs or, you know, kind of really odd little things. And that, I find that quite inspiring. And what I like to do with my own fiction is to seed kind of fictional mythology through them as well. So I tend to try and um, get a sense of place and history in my writing from um, it kind of imposing kind of fictional mythology and folklore into the the settings. The thing I'm probably most proud of is the New Green Hobbs series, um, which is a kind of Victoriana alternative history um, series. And, it, and it's, it's novels and it's comics. Um, and it's inspired by kind of Sherlock Holmes, um, Hammer Horror, Doctor Who, kind of all intermingled. I put all my kind of passions into it. Um, so it follows Newbury, Sir, Sir Maurice Newbury and his assistant, Veronica Hobbs. Um, they work for Queen Victoria. Um, and they basically kind of investigate and defend London um, from occult mysteries and, and strange goings on. Um, and there's a kind of, there's a big, there's six novels. Um, so over the course of the series, they kind of realize that they're kind of working for the bad guy and Queen Victoria is actually the wrong one. Um, so that's, that's kind of the big story arc. 2008, when it was when I had my first novel published that I really felt like I was becoming a professional writer. Um, so I had written before then, written some small press fiction, I'd written a, a non-fiction book about science fiction, um, but it wasn't really until, I'd always wanted to be a novelist, and I think one, the day that that first novel came out and I was able to say, right, I'm a, I'm a professional novelist now, was when I really kind of thought, oh, maybe I could do this as a career. It then took me another kind of, I think seven years before I was able to say, right, I'm now giving up the day job and becoming a full-time writer. And that coincided with when I started to write comics as well. Um, so kind of carried on writing novels, but introduced comics and diversified a little bit into that. So my favorite story, um, it changes over the, over the years, but the, the thing that I've been consistently coming back to kind of over the last five years is a, um, a novel series by Stephen Erickson called The Malazan Book of the Fallen. And it's a, what I call big fat fantasy novels. Um, each book's kind of over a thousand pages and there's 10 of them in the series, so it's quite an epic undertaking. But um, for me, the, the characters, the, the heart that, that, that is kind of, is captured within that story um, and the, um, the scope of it and scale of it. And the way he, he's an anthropologist and archeologist um, and he has imbued his setting with such a sense of history and kind of ancient races and overlapping history um, and that great stories have gone before a bit like Tolkien did but he does it all within this kind of within the scope of the novels rather than writing kind of all the appendices and things that Tolkien did with Lord of the Rings um, and for me it's just it's a work of genius um, but not only is it a work of genius, it's I say it's got real heart as well. So it's um, you know it's, it's the series that's made me cry the most, um, and you know and smile the most as well. So um, I finished that last year, and um, I'm I'm contemplating going back to the start and rereading it all. It's so good. I think it's it's really key to have um, to treat the setting of a of, of a fiction um, as a character as much as the the people that you're putting into it as well. I think a sense of place kind of roots the characters. Um, makes it makes it allows the allows you to kind of suspend disbelief as a reader. I think as well if you're coming at it and you go, oh, these people feel like real people doing real things in a setting that feels real. Then okay, there might be something weird going on. There might be you know vampires or mummies or dragons or something. 
but actually then that doesn't seem so outlandish because you've rooted the characters and, and the sense of place. Um, so, yeah, so I admire that in, in fiction that I read um, and I'm trying to do that myself in my own work. So my dream collaborator would probably be, um, this is a very different answer to, to what I've been talking about so far, but um, would probably be Humberto Ramos, the artist, um, who did a big run on Spider-Man um, with Dan Slott. Um, and I just, I absolutely adore his artwork. Um, and I want to write a Spider-Man story for him to, to illustrate. <laughs> that, that's, that's kind of a dream gig for me. The character I'd most like to write for would be Spider-Man. Um, he's kind of the, the last one on my bucket list that I haven't had a chance to do yet. So I've been very lucky in that I'm, I would have probably said a lot of the Star Wars characters prior to um, this like last couple of years, but I've been very lucky to write some Star Wars um, stories over recent years. So having banked that now, um, Spider-Man is kind of, well, Spider-Man and Batman, it's a toss up. You know, both of them are probably on my bucket list. Um, but yeah, I, I've, I've loved Spider-Man since I was a little kid. Um, I still read all of the comics and um, he's probably the one, if I had a choice to write any other character that I haven't done so far, it would be Spider-Man. Marvel and DC, it's, t it's a difficult toss up. Um, and I mean, I've talked about Spider-Man being kind of the, the bucket list character that I haven't written yet, so I probably would fall on, fall on the side of Marvel, but I actually love DC Comics as well. I, I don't think it's, for me, they're not mutually exclusive at all. I think um, they, they, they do something different. And what I love about Batman and the Bat Universe in particular is that um, the darker, um, more sinister side of things, um, where with Spider-Man, I love the kind of levity and the, um, the gags that he tells while he's, you know, um, beating up villains or whatever, he's making quips. Um, and I think they both offer, offer very different things, so uh, it's, it's a difficult one. So, as, as I say, Spider-Man would be my choice, which would mean Marvel, but actually I'd love to work with DC as well. And, and, re and I do read a lot of DC comics as well. The writer I most admire is um, called M. John Harrison. Um, and he is a literary novelist that works in genre, so he tends to write kind of quite slipstream style novels um, that have elements of, of weirdness and kind of maybe some magic realism or um, even science fiction elements. Um, but he is a prose master. He's you know, a complete stylist. You can tell he labours over every single word. Um, and. His work can be quite profound, I think. Um, in terms of artists and artists um, who I admire, I mentioned Humberto Ramos, who's Spider-Man I absolutely adore. There was an artist called J.H. Williams III as well, who um, it does, he's worked on Sandman, he's worked on Batwoman, um, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, and his artwork is absolutely phenomenal. What, what he can do with a comic page is well, he turns it into a piece of art. I mean, obviously, all comic art is art, um, but he doesn't follow a convention. He doesn't. He's, he's, he's unbound by the kind of idea of we have to do a nine-panel grid or, or what have you. He, he just, you know, he just did a recent comic where it's landscape, which is you know not unique but not typical either, um, and it's it's amazing. So um, so yeah, he's someone who's art I really admire as well. So if I was st if I was Younger again, and I could give, or if I could give myself a piece of my younger self a piece of advice. It would be to trust my instincts more, and um, and allow myself to be as creative as I as I want to be, rather than feeling constrained by. Um, I suppose when I first started writing, I used to think people might not like it if I push push the envelope, or or if I put too much fantasy into this crime story that I'm writing, or you know. Um, and I held myself back a little bit, and it was only in later years when I thought, well, I'm going to try it anyway. I'm going to, I'm going to let the weirdness out, do the, you know, have fun while I'm writing, and and, and be cre more creative. And then I saw readers responding to that in a very positive way, that that kind of reinforced it, and I allowed myself to relax a little bit and go, oh, okay, that's the stuff that people actually want me to do. Um, so yeah, so if I could go back and talk to my younger self, I'd say chill out a bit and just write what's, write what's in your head rather than what you think people want to read. Dream collaborator, um, I'd, 
So aside from writing Spider-Man with Humberto Ramos, which I've said about three times now, just in case he's watching, um, probably it would be Steven Erickson, the, the, the novelist I have mentioned, um, who, you know, I'd love to sit with, with him and um, create a new world um, to explore in stories. I think um, the way, the way he's, he's, he's done it in his own work is absolutely masterful. Um, and I, I think I've learned a lot from the process um, and have fun doing it. So, so yeah, that would probably be my dream collaborator. Who's more valuable, artist or writer? Well, that's a difficult question to ask a writer. Um, <laughs> um, I think both. I think they have both have a part to play, especially in, in comics. Um, I mean, as a writer, obviously for me, it's valuable to have artists because I can't draw for toffee. I mean, I try and sometimes in my scripts to do, I'm thinking of this for a page layer or, you know, and it's stick figures and it's embarrassing. Um, <laughs> But I'd love to. I'd love to be able to to draw my own comics. I can't. So for me, it's very valuable to have artists, and artists who are uh, able to, you know, not just not just draw what I've written, but bring their own artistic flourishes to it and and their knowledge and experience to it. Um, you know, a, a comic is a calibration in the truest sense of it. And you know, when I write a script, I'm th I'm writing it for the artist. I'm not writing it for the end reader. And then the artist is then drawing the script, drawing the the you know the pages for the end reader, and my dialogue will eventually make it onto that page as well. But the artist in that is is the person who thinks visually, who works visually, so they're the one who has you know control of that, and as it should be. Um, but where it's always worked best for me is when I have a good relationship with the artist I'm working with, and we have a lot of back and forth, and we discuss things, and you know we create it together. Um, so, so yeah, so I couldn't live without artists, um, but I wouldn't want them to live without me. 